<laughs> okay, I think we've got to get started because we've got one. We've got five panelists this time, and about an, a little more than an hour to do this. Okay. Now, before I introduce them, I got I want to say something that that I want you to get uh, pay some attention to. After we're done, all right, with this panel, we're going to switch and go to these essentially collaborative work groups, and there's four of them. I'm going to bring this up again at the end, too. There, uh, about, there's something on your name tag that will tell you which group to go to, but don't linger after this panel. There is a work group in here, but I believe the other three are upstairs. And I know the facilitators want as quickly as possible after this panel is done for you to go to those next places so you can do that work and be back in time for Governor Otter when he comes to speak because he's, you know, being a governor obviously has a lot of things he has to do today. So we want to be ready for him and not not there when he's ready to speak to us. I'll bring this up again at the very end, just to, to emphasize this again. But our next panel, round table three, critical habitat designations. Um, that's the topic of this one. Again, our panelists are aligned in the order they'll speak. First, Bruce Farling, the director of Trout Unlimited Montana. And then Dan Dinning, commissioner Boundy, Boundary County here in Idaho. Then Sam Eaton, the policy advisor to the Idaho's Governor's Office of Species Conservation. Ann Forrest Burns, Vice President, American Forest Research Council. Nice middle name, Ann. How did you work that out? And then Trent Clark, Director of Government Affairs of Monsanto uh, here in Idaho again. So, Bruce, let me turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, John. Uh Thanks to the WGA for the invite today and also to Governor Meade for his leadership in terms of putting together, the, I think, these really informative workshops. Um, a couple of things. I decided I wouldn't do a real formal presentation because I knew I'd get off track a little bit after some of the previous ones, especially Virgil's, because Virgil's, whenever I've heard him speak a number of times, he always has my sort of head spinning and I want to respond to some of the things he talks about. But first, a few things about me. The qualifiers. Um, I am not an ESA expert. I am not an expert on critical habitat. In fact, critical habitat designations, I find sort of baffling why uh, it's uh, important to some folks and not as important to some other folks. And I'll get into that a little bit for a moment. Um, there's a whole bunch of these species that I don't know all that much about, at least from a, a following it as a scientist. I don't know that much about lynx. I don't know that much about mountain caribou. I don't know that much about some other species. I'm a lifelong hunter and fisherman. And I will say that, um, I've personally probably um, helped diminish a couple of the listed species that we're talking about here today, bull trout and the, the bird formerly known as the uh, sage chicken. In fact, I've, I've caught and eaten more than a few of Virgil's bull trout over in the Selway country over the years. Um, critical habitat identification is really, really critical to uh, trying to determine the best way to recover and stabilize uh, imperiled species. Absolutely, we have to know where they live, we have to know where these important niches are. I'm a fish guy, primarily a fish guy, and we have to know where they spawn, where they rear, where they overwinter, where they forage. We have to know where these important uh, areas of connectivity are, especially for the migratory species. Um, it's absolutely essential. Designation of critical habitat under ESA is something a little bit different because it's a matter of application and how we exercise, and obviously that's created a whole bunch of heartburn. Um, critical habitat determination uh, per ESA, I think we always have to ask this question. I mean, not all listed species have had critical uh, habitat designated for them, um, but do the costs and the headaches of the designation outweigh the practical benefits? And especially when we start getting arguing, the lawyers start arguing about what is prudent or what is uh, uh, indeterminable in terms of their habitat. And we've really spent a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of headaches uh, have been created over critical habitat designation. A lot of those resources and a lot of that thinking, a lot of that innovation probably should be applied, applied actually to some recovery actions. Um, we have to think about is it definitely critical to conservation and recovery? I don't think it is for some species, but I'm thinking primarily about fish. I do not think it has been critical for bull trout recovery, largely because before 
there was court action that required the service to identify critical habitat. We we're already working on the things that you have to work on. Uh, agencies were doing BAs, there was consultation processes being triggered. Um, there's already some beneficial things already occurring relative to federal or private actions on the landscape and how they affect the fish. Um, sometimes, but not always, the conflicts and time consuming and expensive task of designating critical habitat just flat doesn't get directly at some of the most pressing limiting factors in a species and why they're, why, why they're diminishing. And um, again, an example I have is some of the fish species. Verza brought up a great one with uh, Kootenai white sturgeon. We've got critical habitat, but we can't quite put it together to get that fish recovered. Um, we have a similar problem with pallid sturgeon, which is a fish in the upper Missouri. We do not have critical habitat designated for it. On the other hand, we are at a loss to do what needs to be done to recover that, that species, which has been around since the age of the dinosaurs. And we have, in the last 50 or 60 years, have pretty much pushed them into near uh, functional extinction. Um, bull trout. Uh, or ac actually, let me, let me back up a little bit and talk a little bit about something I don't know that much about, but uh, I know Virgil did hit on it, and that's some of our anadromous fishes. We have 13 or 14 stocks of steelhead and salmon uh, in the Northwest that are listed. Uh, most of those are still kind of in trouble. They all, I believe they all have critical habitat designations. Um, critical habitat addresses two of the four so-called H's that we conservationists look at for recovery of these species deals with habitat degradation and headwaters, where fish spawn, where young fish rear, where smolts are uh, uh, develop. Um, so it can deal with that. Uh, can deal with hydro operations, the other H, have to modify hydro operations because they affect habitat. But it does not address harvest, which is still a problem, especially when we get into estuarine and uh, marine environments, nor does it uh, address uh, hatcheries and hatchery reform that we still need to do in uh, in, in a few states. Um, so critical habitat is great for habitat, but there's just other pressing issues. I would argue in Montana and, uh, and virtually every other professional I know in the fisheries business agrees that many of our bull trout populations are not in trouble right now today because of continuing habitat loss still have some legacy issues on the landscape with old roads, with old bleeding mines, things of that nature. But it's largely, especially with a migratory form that we have in Northwest Montana and the Flathead Swan systems, which are some of the uh, best populations we have left anywhere, bull trout. The problem is these introduced species that we placed on top of these guys, some of it legally, some of it done illegally. Uh, lake trout, which competitive interactions and predation with lake trout is a real problem for bull trout in the flathead system and also in the swan system. Uh, we have predation from illegally introduced pike that stack up uh, at the mouth of the flathead river. These young bull trout come down, uh, try and get back into the, the lake uh, to essentially uh, take care of that part of their life history where they live in a lake for three or four years before they go back up the river and spawn. It's very problematic. Um, we also have hybridization that is increasing with brook trout that we've got on the landscape. And of course, we, uh, the, the outcome of that is, is that we're getting one generation of these hybrids. And fortunately, we're not getting second and subsequent generations. But nonetheless, you lose a whole year of spawning uh, production from bull trout population when they hybridize with brook trout, not addressed by critical habitat. And it's a really, really big problem. Um, Finally, suggestions for what to do. We were asked to come up with some suggestions, and I, I'm having a real hard time coming up with a suggestion to improve the critical habitat designation or application process. One thing I think it needs to occur is it should be uh, uh, intersect a lot more closely with recovery planning. We need to have better recovery planning. I happen to agree with Virgil about the recovery plan that we have for bull trout and how it doesn't have any demographic objectives. There's no metrics for populations. It's all about reducing, and that's fine, reducing the threats on only 75% of the populations that are out there. Um, but we really need to tie it in with recovery plans because that with having a recovery plan tied in with critical habitat, um, it takes care of this question is that not all critical habitat is equally critical. We've got a lot of critical habitat that's been designated out there that I don't think we're ever going to be recover, say, bull trout in. 
um, and certainly not maybe say pallet sturgeon or something like that. Yet sometimes it's treated equally in terms of how the agencies respond to some particular uh, proposal that may affect the habitat. So um, those are my thoughts on that. I certainly hope we uh, when get to questions, I'm able to respond productively to some of you guys. Thanks. <clears throat> sorry, Dan. Fine. I need to stand up. I'm sorry. Um, I want to thank the Western Governors for this opportunity, as all of you have, the association, all of you involved, um, Office of Species Conservation. Dustin, where are you for all your efforts? I'm Dan Dinning. I'm a Boundary County Commissioner. I am in the absolute Let's see, politically correct now, according to the governor, northernmost county in the state. We are known somewhat as Noah's Ark. We have caribou, we have grizzly bear, wolf, wolverine, lynx, Kootenai River sturgeon. Uh, Virgil mentioned the burbot, bull trout, and I'm probably missing one or two. You're going to see some slides here in a minute that um, they'll be short and sweet, but it deals specifically with critical habitat. And I cannot remember which one of the presenters showed the communication about, well, we'll just designate it all. Um, you're gonna see a prime example of this within, within the slides. ESA and critical habitat are about species recovery. And I think that we have failed in this to see that just locking up land without the ability to improve habitat within that is not going to help species recovery. We deal with a whole different landscape than you do down here. We have a forest, a wet forest. And so it will burn hot. There will be disease in it. There will be all kinds of things affected that man in our actions can improve and protect the habitats. We're going to take a look now at this. Uh, this is my county in the red. The blue line was the caribou recovery zone. 375,000 acres of proposed critical habitat is that blue line. There are between zero and depending on the year, five caribou that come into the United States. Most of the time, 90, I'm not even gonna put a percentage, but a huge percentage of the time, they are in Canada. Half of the recovery zone acres is in Canada. We have 375,000 in the U.S. and about that same amount in Canada. Almost all of the time, the caribou live in Canada, except for the northwest corner of my county and the northeast part of Washington, where, depending on the year, there is up to four or five caribou that winter there. Keeping that in mind, there's lynx, not too bad. There's grizzly bear. Notice how the grizzly bear, especially on the west side of the Kootenai Valley, mimics almost identically the caribou recovery zone. Caribou need old growth forest for winter habitat. Grizzly bear need open huckleberry fields. So 
in the land managers uh, have chosen to maybe not want to do anything over there because they can't win. Most of that is national forest. There's a great deal of IDL on there. And they talked uh, earlier about their, their um, actions on their own land. We have a collaborative group called Kootenai Valley Resource Initiative. It was started by Senator Crapo at the same time the Oahe Initiative was started. Ours is constructed a little differently. Uh, we have co-chairs by position within our county chair, our mayor, and our tribal chairman from our Kootenai tribe. Um, we engage heavily in gaining knowledge of ESA issues and hearing the same thing from the managing partners at our meetings at the same place in the same time. When we looked at the proposed critical habitat designation for caribou, it does not make sense. This was the, we'll take it all. My county is about just under 11,000 people. We don't have very big budgets. We have to form partnerships between the tribe, between the Office of Species Conservation, AFRC, uh, others out here that I am going to, to maybe mention. We were quite concerned about the designation of that whole area. And we went through the process of meeting with Fish and Wildlife, of the comments, of the public hearings. And thanks to some good legal advice and some things that we were able to uh, get across, the designation was reduced, the critical habitat designation was reduced down to the little bit up in the corner. Most of it's in Washington, a little bit's in, the, in Idaho, of about 35,000 acres. We can designate anything on the landscape we want. Very similar to what was said. Until we actually do something and tie that to making it a recoverable piece of ground or water. And not just limiting it by the designation. We're not going to succeed with critical habitat intent. And I, and I truly agree with that. The red line on the very north of that map is the Canadian border. In today's climate of national security, our border patrol is restricted from monitoring that as they would wish because of endangered species and critical habitat designation. We have to have an adaptive program in ESA that responds to our changing needs of our country and changing needs of the population. That's my little bit, and I'm sure there's going to be some questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to WGA. Um, thanks to Zach for setting this up. I just handed him an updated PowerPoint just to stress him out a little bit more after I sent him one earlier. Um, it's very humbling to be in this room. Uh, there's there's uh, many of you that I, that I respect, um, and it's, it's difficult to speak up here when I know you're all smarter than me, so bear with me. Um, again, I'm Sam Eaton. Uh, some days I'm the policy advisor, some days I'm the attorney at the Office of Species Conservation. Uh, I'm going to really turn up the excitement level and talk about proposed rules that deal with critical habitat. So try to stay in your seats if you can. Um, these proposed rules were uh, jointly proposed by the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, these proposed rules would change how the service designates critical habitat and how project proponents would deal with critical habitat under Section 7 consultation requirements. 
Uh, again, these were proposed in 2014. Uh, the Office of Species Conservation, where I work, we commented on this on behalf of the state of Idaho. Um, but I have not heard an update. They were supposed to come out last year, uh, but the rules have not been uh, finalized as of yet. Uh, like I said, our office provided comments uh, that were largely critical of the new changes. Um, my focus today isn't really intended uh, to point out uh, what the state views as flaws with these proposals, but to look at whether or not these new changes uh, will do what they aim to do, uh, which is to provide and add clarity to the critical habitat process. Um, and as you'll see, there's a common thread to these proposals um, and that the service appears to have a lot more discretion to determine what qualifies as critical habitat and what level uh, these proposed actions may impact the critical habitat. All right. Uh, first, the proposed rules would change how the service designates critical habitat under Section 4, which is the listing section of the ESA. Um, again, the service's stated purpose under this proposal is to add clarity for the public, clarify expectations, and provide for a credible, predictable, and simplified critical habitat designation process. Uh, and we'll see if that actually happens when these are implemented, but uh, there's some skepticism. Um, as many of you know, Section 4 requires a service to designate those geographic areas occupied by the species at the time of listing that contain the physical or biological features that are essential to the conservation of the species. Uh, so under this proposal, the ones that are underlined there, uh, those are the phrases or terms uh, that were previously undefined by the service and they are now trying to, uh, they are now proposing to define those phrases to add clarity. Um, the new definition of geographical areas occupied by the species um, would allow the service to designate areas not used on a regular basis. Uh, and the service has stated that because some species are difficult to survey, uh, they may rely on circumstantial evidence. Uh, so obviously that causes the state some concern when you uh, add new terms like not used on a regular basis. Um, by defining a term, you thereby create new terms that need to be defined. Uh, otherwise, it's up to the agency discretion, um, which sometimes gives us concern. Uh, so what's, what constitutes not uh, used on a regular basis? Um, this is probably a little hyperbolic, but you know, a question I had is it could be the presence of a feather on the ground uh, constitute circumstantial evidence uh, of occupancy of some species of bird. Um, and that's to be determined, we don't know, but there's concern that an area that may not have solid, uh, going back to best available science, uh, to back up these claims could potentially be designated as critical, critical habitat. Um, as, as a state, we'd appreciate a little more predictability for the process. And again, we don't think this adds clarity um, and actually murks up the process. Um, in addition, the service proposes to define physical and biological features for the first time. I'll change the slide for you. Uh, this new definition would allow the service to designate areas of critical habitat, uh, even if the physical and biological features do not currently exist, uh, but there's a reasonable expectation that they will occur again in the future. Uh, that kind of goes back to the same thing, uh, a lot of discretion on the part of the service. Uh, what does reasonable expectation mean? Um, new definition, again, requires some more discretion, uh, and it would be nice if we had some more definitions, but where do you stop, I guess, with the definitions? Uh, so what constitutes uh, a reasonable expectation? Um, again, we're concerned that it'd be too much discretion uh, to designate critical habitat, uh, but we don't know yet until these rules are implemented. Uh, moving on to uh, a new definition of adverse modification, and this has to do with Section 7 consultation. Uh, so if a proposed action is going to take place that has a federal nexus, uh, most of you know this, but uh, there's a requirement to consult over projects with a federal nexus to determine whether or not the action will jeopardize the continued existence of a species or result in the destruction or adverse modification of critical habitat. Um, the current definition of adverse modification uh, was thrown out by the Fifth and Ninth Circuits, um, and now the service is attempting to redefine that phrase. Under the new definition, an action may result in adverse modification of critical habitat, even if the habitat does not currently possess the requisite physical or biological features, uh, but the habitat has the potential to provide those, fe those features in the future. Um, just like with the Section 4, definition of physical and biological features, uh, there's some uncertainty how the service will implement this new definition. Um, of course, there's fear of the unknown. Um, and it's conceivable that service could determine that a proposed action could adversely modify critical habitat simply because it's plausible that sometime in the future, um, uh, 
that it could impact uh, this species' ability to recover, um, despite the current habitat's uh, inability to provide for that recovery. Sorry, I missed. I should have changed that earlier. Um, sorry, I know that was a really terse uh, and quick uh, overview, um, but this shows not only the potential issues uh, from the state's perspective with these new definitions, but also the difficulty that arises when trying to simplify any federal process. Um, it is not easy. It's no easy feat on the services part, um, and we we actually applaud them for trying to add clarity. Uh, however, we don't believe that these proposals add clarity to the critical habitat process. Um, and just like I said before, adding a new definition causes concern because then you have to define uh, terms within the new definition. Uh, with that, I'll wait for questions at the end. Thank you. So hello everyone and with the usual thanks to everyone, especially Zach who got me into this and Tom Troxell who got me to Zach, um, I, am, I am really glad to be here and to bring you sort of a forestry voice uh, in this whole thing. Um, my office is in Portland, Oregon and I practiced law for a long time in Washington State. And I'm a child of the Olympic Peninsula, so um, spotted owls. Yeah, been at this for a while, uh, and we we like to think that a lot's been learned that we we like for you to benefit from, since we're not sure we have. Um, the American Forest Resource Council represents uh, those who utilize timber from federal lands in Washington, Oregon, California, Idaho, and Montana. Uh, and so critical habitat designations uh, involve us very heavily in uh, the agencies needing to do Section 7 consultations. Uh, so critical habitat is, is very important to us. Uh, we have an undocumentable feeling uh, that agencies, management agencies, uh, pull away from certain uh, actions or uh, modify their actions in order to be able to avoid Section 7 consultations and in order to be able to avoid adverse mod uh, determinations. So we believe this has a, a chilling effect on certain management practices that we believe would ultimately be to the benefit of, of the listed species and to non-listed species. So it's, a, it's an area of, of real uh, interest and concern. Uh, we have some suggestions, uh, which is what I was asked to bring you. Um, so uh, we believe that we need to clarify the objective of classifying lands as critical. Uh, according to the act, areas designated as critical habitat must be essential to bring the species to the point where it can be delisted. Uh, using just an ordinary dictionary definition of essential, because apparently Congress didn't think it needed to, to define that for us, it's, is it truly necessary? Um, and I want to point out that the Donna Darm uh, email was from 1998. But distrust is a thing that um, is hard to dispel. Uh, the sense that we just ask for it all because we don't really know what we need, uh, that's, that does not seem to be in service of either <coughs> the agency, the public, or the species and hopefully the panel you just heard from that talked about science uh, can really help us with that and and we can be insisting that uh, that be brought to bear. Um, when determining if an area may require special management considerations or protections we need to ensure that current land management uh, plans uh, on federal lands particularly, but certainly on state and private lands as well, are given, are given uh, full credit rather than there being an assumption that absent uh, 
ESA protections, nothing good will happen that's beneficial to the species on those lands or feeling that those plans are so changeable that they cannot be uh, trusted. Uh, th those are of great concern. When determining the economic impact of a designation, uh, it is our belief that both the economic impact of the listing as well as the economic impact of the designation of the particular landscape needs to be fully taken into effect and into account in, in making those, those determinations. And I would point out that economic impacts are in the statute as something that needs to be taken in consideration when critical habitat is de designated. And, and we are concerned that, that, that there is not good economic science being brought to bear on these designations. Once an area has been designated, we need to assure that there's efficient and timely consultation among the agencies. Uh, we have we have timber sales that have, were purchased and have been in abeyance for years and years because because the consultations are not being pushed forward because there is not the apparently the either the will or the uh, or the or the budget. Uh, for there to be personnel to, to move forward. We need to recognize that, that plans developed under NFMA or FLIPMA have been through the, the NEPA process, which is a public involvement process, and they can't be changed without a similar process. Again, harking back to my, my idea that they need to be given uh, credit. Although it can be difficult to collectively consult at the plan level, uh, that certainly makes more sense than at the project by project level when you're looking at conserving a species and at these huge uh, habitat designations. No ac the no action alternative, the business of not deciding, uh, needs to be taken into account. Fire is one of the uh, results of our not deciding, and I can't think of uh, a worse impact on critical habitat uh, than burning it all up. So in some AFRC is certainly not opposed to species listings. We like to see critical habitat listed at the same time because we think it's the best way for, for the full impact of the listing to be recognized and taken into effect and for, for us to start to go forward with the recovery of the species. So that's that's our bit on critical habitat. Thanks. I'm Trent Clark with Monsanto. Again, I would like to thank Governor Mead for taking on what is um, kind of the West's insurmountable uh, golden chalice of making the Endangered Species Act work. Um, I served for uh, on the staff of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee for 10 years, was not there when the Endangered Species Act was enacted, but I actually had the chance to work side by side with some of the council that drafted the Endangered Species Act, and they felt deeply and passionately about it. I now work for Monsanto, and uh, Monsanto mines phosphate ore, phosphate ore over in the Caribou Highlands, which is just north of Bear Lake. That's important because that is critical sage-grouse habitat around Bear Lake, and just south of the Palisades, which is another very important sage-grouse habitat area. And the question came up to Monsanto, well, we're not inside the lines on the map, so does that mean we need to do nothing? And the answer we got from everybody that we consulted with was no. That does not mean you get to do nothing. So the next question we had was, well, what is the right thing to do? Uh, when Monsanto encounters those questions, we tend to go to the top. We, we say, so who's the, the best experts? In 2004, Cambridge University assembled the best biologists and ecologists around the world, including a couple of Nobel laureates who gathered together and created what many of you may know of as the Handbook of Ecological Restoration Number 2. I haven't even read Number 1, but Handbook of Ecological Restoration Number 2 in the preface was dedicated to mining in North America and even explained why it was dedicated to mining in North America. It said, 
that the kind of the default created by CITES and the Endangered Species Act and other things um, is, is X. But we think in North America, you're enlightened enough and rich enough that you should do more than X. And that was the rationale, was that we should, and by the way, it kind of flips the, uh, is, is economics to be considered under the Endangered Species Act on its head in the sense of uh, it's possible that you have kind of a scientific standard that says, well, here's what we're going to do as long as we can afford it. And that some cases you can afford to do more and you should do more. So that's what the Handbook of Ecological Restoration told Monsanto, is you should do as much as you possibly can and should focus on systems. You should, fo and that's what's on the slide here, is, is in restoration ecology today, you don't talk so much about an individual species as you talk about the function that species serves in the system and, and how important that function is and how the system itself is damaged if you lose that component of the system. And so, so what we looked at is what the handbook says specifically for sagebrush steppe and subalpine forest because that's actually where we mine is right in the interface between sagebrush steppe and subalpine forest. And the handbook, the, these, these biologists and ecologists came and said, okay, here are the critical systems in these ecosystem types that you better make sure, you dang miners, you better not disrupt those systems. That was kind of the mandate in the handbook to us. So, so what you see presented here on this slide is, is kind of our hierarchy as we look at the different systems that we know we're going to have to assess before we mine. We're going to have to mine conscious of in every way, shape and form possible, not disrupting those systems or being prepared to put those systems back. And then when we're done mining, uh, how to restore them. So, so here's what we're doing, operating in between critical habitats we've kind of created a four-step approach. Our first step is we avoid. Avoid in every case habitat that we're talking about, land, forested areas, plant systems that are serving critical functions. Now, let me tell you the extent to which we have gone. We, when we started our mine design, uh, we actually already owned, we'd already done the land purchases to purchase a, you see the purple, uh, that would be our haul road, how we would haul our ore from the mine to processing. A little over $5 million spent in land acquisition. This was before sage grass became an issue. As it turns out, that road that we designed, it was really a beautiful road, about 150 foot decline over an eight mile path, uh, course. It would have been perfect for hauling. But uh, it just happens to go across two valley floors which were really important sage grass habitat. So avoid, the principle avoidance tells us what we are now going to propose is that we're going to, instead of heading west with our ore, taking it toward the processor, we're going to start by going east with our ore and hitting an already existing rail line. And once we are hit to that rail line, then we can just use that existing rail line to take the ore to our point of processing. And um, I already mentioned it, it cost us $5 million to acquire the land for the road we're now not going to build. Um, instead, we're going to use a fellow phosphate mining company's um, loading equipment, which is right where you see that, that small road that hits over to the east and, and uh, abuts up against the railroad track. I'll tell you, we're almost at $5 million just in the legal fees of how to figure out how to use someone else's equipment and not take all of their li environmental liability. So that's avoidance. The next uh, two steps are, are to minimize your impact or restore. And I want to point out, this is, this is where the Freemuth principle of the science is never end kicks into uh, effect. And that is when you go to minimize your impacts and restore what was damaged, it cannot be based on national generics. It has to be based on site specifics. And usually, you can't just go to your local library and find a handbook of the site specifics. You have to find those out, and that requires research. And so, so our, our next steps are minimize and restore. Now, when I talk about restore, um, one of the things, for instance, is you might think, well, what, mining companies just need to revegetate. Well, revegetate, as it turns out, is a 37-step process, which includes looking at what phase of succession you're in. For instance, in subalpine forest, 
your, your climax species is going to be one thing. In sagebrush steppe, it's going to be a different species. And so you need to look at where you are in the succession. And, and it used to be that mining companies could just go out and plant a bunch of seeds. Now we have to plant some seeds. We also have to grow tublings. We have to grow uh, little branchlings. We have to actually plant the thing that will survive at that point of the succession. Because if you try to plant a full a sage in, in an environment that really sage is a climax species and small sage will just get eaten up, you can't just do it by planting seeds. So we have to identify how big does the plant have to be in order to survive in the environment. Now, only after we've done everything we can to minimize and restore, then we look at the fourth, and the fourth action is to mitigate. Um, we have, we've actually looked at the president's most recent uh, guidance on mitigation. We don't have real concerns with this, but we do believe that the words of the Endangered Species Act were unfortunately fixed on paper, whereas science has changed. And that the whole concept of mitigating an acre for an acre is a little passe. It's a little 1960s, if you don't mind my saying so. The, the modern concept, again, advised to us from that handbook of ecological restoration, is that what we should be mitigating for is not necessarily acres of real estate, but services. There will be instances, for instance, where what is needed because we're mining in one area is not land somewhere else. That land may already exist. What may, may be needed somewhere else is water. The, the, the critical component that is missing that would make great habitat that would allow a population to survive while we're mining is that they need water over there. And so perhaps what we do with our water right should be considered as part of how we would mitigate for the survival of a, of a species. And that concludes my presentation other than just to, to say that uh, our costs in just the last 20 years went from about $3,000 an acre to our most recent mine reclamation is now coming in at about $240,000 an acre. So this move toward ecological restoration does come with a fairly significant price tag. Thank you. Hey, Trent, what's wrong with the 60s, man? <laughs> Getting old. All right, let me um, kick it off with a couple of questions for, for all the panelists and then turn it over to you. We've got till about 12.10, so we've got some time. Um, I don't know if this is a softball or the obvious question, but what is the role of critical habitat designations in conserving rare and in peril species how effective do you feel that that designation process currently is at actually conserving and recovering species with an emphasis on recovery? So all, anyone, all of you, that's something you probably all have thought about a lot one way or the other. So whoever wants to take the first plunge. <laughs> I guess I'll say something. I think Bruce kind of hinted to this in his, um, I would, I'm sure there's examples of this, but I think at least under section seven, there's probably not a whole lot of examples of a species being found to, uh, or sorry, to be for adverse modification uh, under for critical habitat, but not jeopardize the species. So I think the point that Bruce was getting to is that often critical habitat uh, is redundant. And of course there's arguments on both sides. Um, and, but especially with the fish world, I think that you'd be hard pressed to find where critical habitat is really going above and beyond what a listing would already do. Um, I don't have the answer necessarily to, to figure out what capacity critical habitat, um, how they need to reform that in order to add more to a listing. Um, but in my limited experience, uh, adding critical habitat to a listing, other than doing it simultaneously so you have some predictability, doesn't add much in terms of conservation uh, very often. I think I'm going to have to clarify what I said, um, but no, actually, uh, actually, that was pretty correct. I think it's, from my experience, what I've seen where a handful of species has been mixed to sort of redundant. Um, that said, uh, from a conservation biology perspective, we absolutely have to identify what habitat is critical to meet the, you know, basically the life stage 
and the life histories of, of these species we're looking at. Whether we take that next step and formally designate it under the ESA, that's another matter. I think we've got about what, 1,600 listed species in the country. I think we've only got about 600 to 650 actual formal designations of critical habitat. And I think if you probably compare the one where we do have those designations and where we don't, I don't think you're going to find any particular positive conclusion that where we designated it was always superior to where we didn't. <clears throat> And I guess one of mine is just the whole question of, for some species, what portion of their, uh, wh whether, whether the habitat that is being designated is the critical issue to recovery. And my poster child is the marbled murrelet, which spends so much of its time at sea, but old growth forests are are being designated as critical habitat and we have a lot more apartments than we have occupants uh, for apartments and and so you know there's there's got to be a balance there somewhere it's not a it's not a build it and they will come situation I like to build it and they will come <laughs> um, all of this habitat changes whether it's critical or non-critical. It's going to change. And what I sense with, or what I see with the designation on the land of critical or in the water is in the cases that I'm aware of, it might as well be wilderness. And I think there's a component there that, w that we need to, to, to look at so that we can actually say, okay, this is critical habitat. How do we maintain it? How do we improve it? How do we protect it? Because things change and they're going to. There's going to need to be the ability to maybe take certain areas off of critical habitat and say, well, this now is the animals are using here. They've moved out of this. I don't see that. Uh, ability at the current time. I do think that the definition of critical habitat needs to be rethought. As I said, I think I think we need to talk more in terms of services instead of acres. But um, the, the problem that kept coming back to the Senate committee where I worked on was how do you make critical access something that isn't just a way to punish everybody who hasn't clear cut their forest already. Um, it, it needs to be a concept of of this is what this land could do and support and and very important species or species that are facing extinction need those services here and and that then defines critical habitat is because it's a place where you can provide those services that keep that species alive on earth and and that that's the concept that kind of needs to be reinfused back into the act so it's not just a how do we punish the people who haven't clear cut their land already Okay, let me, this, we have another question for everybody that kind of gets into what they just talked about. Um, and it gets very difficult, I think, for, for clear answers. And, and Sam sort of maybe hit on it with these new proposed regs. And that's this, on the notion of historically occupied habitat and currently occupied habitat, is the consideration of historic range of a species appropriate in critical habitat designations and listing and delisting decisions. Is there such a thing as a sweet spot between both historic range and current range when considering critical, critical habitat, especially now that, that Dan has suggested, and rightly, I think, that things do change. W what are your thoughts on, on that, that business? Anybody? Dan, you probably have a few, but for everybody. Well, being a lawyer, I'll just pull the definitions out. Spe specific areas within the geographic area occupied by the species at the time it is listed. Anybody else? Uh, that was one of the key components in reducing or looking at the reduction of the proposed critical habitat in my county from the 375,000 acres to the northwest corner is because that is where they were at the time of listing. They were listed in the middle 
1950s, I believe, and for security of the animal, there was not a request for designation of critical habitat until the uh, settlement, I believe, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife in the <coughs> District of Columbia Court, and I cannot recall the years, but that is what triggered the look at critical habitat. I lost your question in my head. Oh, it's just about change in historic range versus... In historic range. Um, historically, I've been told, the greatest concentration of grizzly bear in the continental U.S. was San Francisco Bay. Where do we define historic range? Good question. Anybody else on this one? Um, while you're while the uh, microphone folks are getting ready to take questions, here's another one that's obviously on everybody's mind on one way or the other, and it's for Ann and Dave, but anybody can answer it. Um, at what point, if there is a point in the ESA listing process, do you feel that an economic analysis is most important? Oh, anybody can answer it. <laughs> Any, sure, it was for Anna Day, but anybody. Uh, um, I would say right up front of the listing and relook again if there is a gap in the critical habitat. I can use caribou as an example. There um, used to be a significant number of snowmobile businesses in my county in my town they would snowmobile over the Selkirks to Priest Lake and back Selkirks were a busy place to play then came caribou restrictions lawsuits I think I might have one snowmobile dealership left you cannot go over to the lake and back the service says that they're only to look at the economic impact to themselves and other agencies, not to the communities. And I tend to disagree with that at times. I think that it should be a full economic impact to the cities, the counties, and the state at two junctures. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Go ahead, Sam. Uh, I'll probably just going to say what Ann was going to say, and, and then recently uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and the National Marine Fishery Service, uh, with regards to economic analysis under critical habitat, said that you can only, you have to take out what sort of economic impact would be that would occur from a listing and throw that out. You have to look at only the incremental additional economic impact after the listing solely from critical habitat, which in my perspective is very minimal if not at all i mean there's going to be instances where there's going to be a little bit of additional economic impact from a critical habitat that you wouldn't see from just a listing uh, but i think that's really cheating uh, the economic analysis by not diving into what the impacts are going to be from a listing whether or not you can really use that to do anything because under a listing you can't take into account the economics but i think it's unfair to the counties the communities to disregard the uh, economics that are going to be occurring from the listing and from the critical habitat. I do not believe that anyone intended the economic impact of the listing of the spotted owl. I do not believe that anyone intended the devastation to small communities in Washington and Oregon and Northern California uh, that resulted. It was an unbalanced uh, response to a perceived problem. Uh, this is, the ESA is a creature of Congress. We live in a democracy. Uh, it is appropriate and fair for everyone to understand the impact both on the species and on the resident human beings of a listing or a critical habitat designation. Uh, we need, you know, I mean, everybody who's talked about effectiveness has talked about we're all in this together and we have skin in the game and we're stakeholders. 
And I believe that's how we are going to resolve the problem of balancing um, what we need, all, all of the needs uh, for our public lands, particularly in this country. And so why you would not uh, display the potential impact on the species if we don't do something and the potential economic impact on the residents of various options uh, is baffling to me. And I just, you know, economics is just one way to display results. Do we have John, questions? Could I answer that yeah, question? Trent, go ahead. Sure. I just wanted to say, my, one of the, my major professors, Dr. Daniel Jansen, the grandson, by the way, of the first U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service director, um, he was a contributor to that handbook of ecological restoration that I mentioned. Dr. Jansen always used to have to defend why he put seven soccer fields in Santa Rosa Park, which is that that uh, uh, West Costa Rica coast uh, forest that he preserved and won all kinds of national uh, kudos for having done that. But he put seven soccer fields in it. And, and when asked, why did you put seven soccer fields in habitat you're trying to preserve for wildlife, he said, that was what was necessary to get the community to be in favor of doing what we did. And I think there's some value when we talk about should, when should we insert economics? Well, when your alternative is you turn the very people who should be the stewards and caretakers of a species as their opponents. At that point, you need to start thinking about what are the incentives here? What, Bruce, one more thing and then we'll take the question. Sure. Um, not to belittle the economic interests that are affected through listing, and it's pretty important in my organization to make sure Dan and his county aren't adversely affected or that Ann and her industry isn't adversely affected as much as possible. We just got done a panel where we talked about best available science, whether peer review works, whether it's this person's opinion versus that person's opinion, and there was actually some pretty good recommendations from that panel. I would expect the same amount of rigor same amount of peer review of so-called economic science that we demand for the natural science that we put into these decisions. Because sometimes the economic stuff gets generalized a little bit. The spotted owl, I think, has been generalized a little bit. It wasn't only the spotted owl. It was new forest plans that came out under the National Forest Management Act that reflected the changing desires of people in the Northwest for different services from their national forests that included clean water, taking care of anadromous fish, taking care of resident fish, taking care of recreation, things we hadn't looked at previous to that. That also affected the reduction in some of the, the timber outputs that we had on those forests, as did, frankly, the economy, because we had sort of a up and down sort of demand at the time in the 80s for actually for wood products. So I would expect that we would demand the same amount of rigor for evaluating economic impacts as we are hearing that we need to do for the natural science that leads to listing decisions or the identification of critical habitat. Let's uh, go ahead. Question? Yes, uh, Gordon Cruikshank, Commissioner from Valley County, Idaho. And primarily, I'd like to comment this morning the co that the comment was made, what's the BLM? That's part of our issue. We have a whole, Anne talked about the democracy. We have a whole bunch of people that don't understand the landscape, the scale of the landscape that we're dealing with. But my question primarily is to Ann, because we have two critical habitat designations over in the Oregon, Washington uh, side with spotted owl and a barred owl. The barred owl impacts the spotted owl by killing the, the spotted owl, but yet I understand that there were some uh, operations taken to eliminate some of the barred owls to try to save the spotted owl. Can you expound on that a little bit more? It kind of ties back into what Commissioner Dinning was talking about with the grizzly bear habitat being overlaid over the top of a caribou habitat, but then they were able to really get site specific and pull that down. But it's still an issue with the barred owl and the spotted owl. Thank you. Okay, well, with the barred owl, we're talking invasive species, basically. Um, not human imported, imported by themselves. Um, were, you know, what I expect to see with cougars in Wisconsin one of these days, a uh, lot of deer out there. Um, so, so, you know, it's partly that, that partly leads to the question of what is the limiting factor, you know, whether, whether habitat is the limiting factor or something else is the limiting factor for the spotted owl right now. The Fish and Wildlife Service has, as I understand it, an experimental design for eliminating uh, barred owls in certain areas to see uh, if that will help 
the spotted owl, and I don't believe that experiment uh, is moving forward. Um, there is there is a timber company that that does do uh, barred owl control uh, to keep spotted owls on their landscape in Northern California, but as far as I know, the Fish and Wildlife Service is not yet. Um, controlling owls or spotted owls or I'm sorry controlling barred owls uh, you know, they're to attempt they will attempt to do this scientifically rather than anecdotally uh, and as far as I know it isn't yet happening if anybody in the audience knows more please speak up another question There's a, will do you have a mic already go ahead yeah um, this question is mostly for Commissioner Dinning but others please chime in. Uh, Dan, you mentioned you, you feel like you're on the deck of, the, of Noah's Ark from time to time. So from that view from the deck, thinking about how Governor Mead launched this initiative looking for best practices that can be shared for improving the efficiency and the effectiveness of the ESA. You've got a lot going on in your county with Burbitt, Sturgeon, and so on. What do you see on the positive side that you think your county has to show the rest of the West about how to do this well? I'm supposed to say that's a great question so I can gather time to think, right? <laughs> um, yeah. My comments today were generally about critical habitat. Um, and I mentioned earlier at the same time that the Oahe Initiative was formed, we formed a local collaborative also. Uh, at the urging of Senator Crapo, and that was about 2000, 2001. Prior to that, in my community, if you were a managing agency, state or federal, and came into my community, you would need armed security at the meeting. And I'm serious. Uh, it, it, it isn't just a statement. And since the formation of the collaborative, uh, communication between the city, the county, and our local Kootenai tribe, uh, they are the co-chairs, has improved drastically. We had friends, now we call them friends and partner, that before were just those environmental groups that want to sue. Today they are alongside of us in, in the efforts of managing the land, of improving the species, of doing what whatever it is that we can do to make my community better in our eyes. They have skin in the game, as was mentioned earlier. They live in my community. And so th this collaboration that we talk about is hard, hard work. And I'm thankful that the federal agencies and state agencies are now a big part of that in my community, along with the conservation groups. We all have perspectives that need to be respected. And the great quote is, if you can live with it, then let's see what we can do about doing it. But, but Will, I think in, in our community, that's been, been a, um, a change over the last 15 years from how we dealt with these issues. It, um, an Idaho story here on this is every year for five years, the Idaho Forest Restoration Partnership has met here in Boise, not just because of endangered species, it's bigger than that, but I know some of the commissioners in the room, Will and others have, have worked and every year come together as kind of a learning experience and how can they do forest restoration here. And it's built a lot of good relationships. And I know people in other states have their own versions of that, but I just wanted to note that briefly because I think they're going to meet again next month. I think we got time for one more question. If there's somebody, their hands up, so just run to, they have a mic already, somebody? There it is. Go ahead. Whoever's got the mic, fire away. Uh, Sam McDonald, the Independent Petroleum Association of America. Um, Sam, um, my question is more for you specifically. Our members are really concerned about the critical habitat proposed rules that are expected out any day now, um, in particular because of the undefined 
components that you uh, identified as being unoccupied areas, which they have the authority to do so already, but lacking any biological features under the, the premise of climate change, which further isn't, isn't defined. But my question is, um, for a state that has as much federal land as you do, um, have you done any modeling in the economic vein about how this could potentially impact revenues um, to the state and federal government, because I think that would be helpful in um, articulating that to OMB or whomever before the final rules come out. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, no, I, I, not, my office is, is, is very small and being the attorney, I avoid modeling, um, but I think that would be uh, a very good thing. Uh, obviously our, our Department of Fish and Game um, has a lot of data, and, and you're right, and we have rely heavily on the federal agencies because Idaho's 60 plus percent of, of federal land. And I think, uh, I mean, I think you sort of, my answer was sort of your question that I, I think when you're so impacted, you're so heavily reliant on federal lands, of course, uh, there's going to be an impact. And of course, there's fear of the unknown of what's going to happen, uh, what discretion the agency is going to use to potentially. Uh, designate critical habitat in areas that are corridors or flyovers. We just don't know. And what's the, you know, somebody that exists, whether you have private or you have a federal allotment or some sort of federal nexus in these areas, I think there's going to be a lot of um, insecurity in what this impact is going to be on you because, like I said, you can tell you could find, you know, bird poop on your property and that might, uh, you know, Signify that signify that it's occupied now. So I think I think an economic impact or some sort of modeling would be helpful, but we have not done that yet. And I think it's also important to note. We, we, I mean, these rules have been out for a year and a half. We don't know if they're going to even be implemented yet. I have a feeling. Well, I know they got a lot of negative comments, um, like they always do on everything from every side. Um, but I think maybe they're reassessing and maybe retooling would be my guess. Um, so we'll see if they potentially open up a new proposal that would then go through comments and then be finalized. Uh, I don't know. I know somebody has a mic, so I want to give them the last question. Now, thank you, Pat O'Toole, uh, Family Farm Alliance. You know, I, I think about, you know, the pitfalls and when you, I'm involved in collaborative process on sage grouse and have been for a while and it looks like it has a lot of benefit. If the forest uh, spotted owl process had had that kind of collaborative I don't imagine we'd have that article yesterday in the national paper about the logger that became a prison guard, because that was the that was the sort of the substitution for logging was was training to be prison guards, or um, with the Delta smelt where we're looking at a process that if we'd had this process we use today, I doubt would we would be in the disaster we're in. And the third one is the wolf in Wyoming where all the good faith, both the service and the governor's office in the state of Wyoming ended up with court shopping in DC to stop that um, process from going forward. So I guess my question is how do we take all the goodwill in the world that we're evolving to try to you know, do all these different things when in fact the judicial system is broke from the perspective of a fair hearing, it's, uh, you know, that's a real frustration. Anybody want to take on the court system before we break? Well, I, I will very quickly say that I, I am a great fan of a constitutional system that has checks and balances. Um, you know, we have three branches of government for a good reason. And uh, when we have, you know, when we have administrative agencies um, that are not paying, do not, when administrative agencies or if administrative agencies do not pay attention to the mandates given to them by Congress, then it is appropriate uh, to ask the courts to sort that out. Uh, so we don't always get uh, decisions we like from the courts, but they tell us where the problems are and where we need to um, focus on other branches of government. So um, I, I, I don't think it's broken. Honestly, I don't. Dan, go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. You all get your shot. Just I don't care. <laughs> People are ready to eat, so okay. let's go. If I understand your question correctly, why spend all this time and effort and collaboration when ultimately it's going to be in court and a judge is going to decide it? My experience has been a little bit different in that. Um, we have a, uh, a tribe that's one of our collaborative partners. We have several conservation partners. 
and when and if we need to go to court, they are alongside of us or we are alongside of them. And so we have a tribe that chooses to exert its sovereignty for our benefit. And that's a partnership that I don't think exists in a lot of places, but it is very, very beneficial to us. Uh, it creates a much more thorough look at the science because of that. So uh, I, I think these collaboratives can form partnerships that should stick together through thick and thin, however that looks. Just a quick word on collaboration. Um, we, in, we embrace it. We're involved in it heavily all over the West. We're very much involved in a number of initiatives in Montana. Um, it's happening a lot of places. It's great to hear in Bonner County because I know some of the history in Bonner County and Boundary County in North Idaho. And uh, but it, peace, peace is largely breaking out in a lot of places around the West. But I'm going to blame a couple other of the wings of, of our government. Number one is what often happens with the collaboratives, you can put a whole bunch of time into resolving issues, settling stuff, going 80 percent the way you want to, you only can't get 100, get 80, the other person gets 80. You could come to some resolution and then you got to take it to the next step where you need funding or you need maybe some statutory changes or you need something from either the legislative or executive branches of government and that's kind of where it's sort of falling apart. We can't get help from Congress on a lot of these uh, collaborative solutions. And I, I can give you some examples where we put in eight or nine or 10 years on some national forest related things where we got 90% of the people we needed there, except when we had to go to Congress to get the, the final resolution, get the tools we needed, it failed. It's also happened in our legislature and it's also happened and occasionally at our executive branch. So the people, we're doing our thing and peace is breaking out, but we really, really need some help from the body politic. <clears throat> okay, Trent, I'll give you the last I, word. I just hope people, from the example I showed you, uh, where we we changed our transportation route, you, we can we can actually draw upon the best advice of a lot of biologists for what one attorney costs us. And so, <laughs> the the bottom line is, is I think whether the system is broken or not, it's creating a good incentive. And I I, could, I very much agree with the commissioner. Our last mine, our Blackfoot Bridge mine. Contrary to every expectation that we had within the company, we were actually able to per permit that without even so much as a 49 cent stamp on an appeal envelope. I mean, we did not have to go to court over that, but it was because we approached it from a collaborative standpoint and we tried to bring in the best scientists and we tried to bring in not the scientists that would tell Monsanto what Monsanto wanted to hear, but the folks that would tell us maybe the thing we didn't want to hear. And we could do that all for cheaper than litigating the whole thing. And and we feel like that was the better option. Okay, Sam. 10 Quick. seconds. Uh, I'll just give a brief example of how collaboration can be very effective in the courts. Uh, and you can look to Idaho's rollless rule. I think that's a prime example of how a judge can look at look at a group and how collaborative it was and how effective that can be in either subconsciously or consciously for the judge. We have Idaho put together their roadless rule, had federal, state, environmental, tribal, every, a support from all the spectrums. And I think that went a long way uh, with the court system. So I think uh, maybe it's changing a little bit, but I have seen firsthand uh, the effectiveness that collaboration can have. 